NVIDIA's GTX 1650 was sworn to secrecy, with drivers held for, quote, unification reasons. That doesn't sound weird. Up until actual launch date. The GTX 1650 comes in variants ranging from 75 watts to 90 watts and above, meaning that some options will run without a power connector, while others will focus more on boosted clocks, power target, and require a 6-pin connector for overclocking. GTX 1650s will start at $150, with this model costing $170 and running a higher power target stock, more overclocking headroom, and potentially better challenging some of NVIDIA's past generation products. We'll see how far we can push the 1650 in today's benchmarks, including overclock testing to look at maximum potential versus a 1660. We're using the official unmodified GTX 1650 430.39 public driver from NVIDIA for this review. Before that, this video is brought to you by Deepcool's Captain 240 Pro Closed Loop Liquid Cooler. The new Captain 240 Pro comes with RGB illuminated fans and a pump, easily synchronized to each other for color matching in your system. The Captain 240 Pro radiator also uses a unique elastic pressure relief bladder in the water tank as a leak prevention mechanism. It expands and contracts based upon liquid temperature to counteract AIO leak concerns. The cooler is available now and you can learn more at the link in the description below. The official drivers came out at 9 a.m. today. It is presently 1.50 p.m. and we got the card in at about 8 a.m. So we had this one hour before launch. We got the drivers at launch and now we've finished testing, or some of it's still ongoing, but it's mostly done. So the problem here is that NVIDIA withheld drivers. Typically, we get press drivers in advance of launch. This is so that we have time to really put together a solid review and make sure we look at every aspect of the card. Now, fortunately, because we are pretty efficient here, we've still done our full 100% review without cutting corners. But it wasn't easy, and that's because of the, the secrecy around the drivers. And the reasoning one might postulate for withholding drivers is not because, as NVIDIA says, it's to unify them or something, but rather because probably the RX 570 is better, is what it's going to come down to. But that's not going to stop us from a day one review. So we're working with the EVGA GTX 1650 SC Ultra. For this review, I will probably call it XC Ultra by accident a few times or the entire review, because they keep changing the names on us. But the 1650 SC Ultra is a 90 watt reference, uh, 90 watt power consumption for the board versus reference of 75. So EVJ has boosted the power available to the card, which means that it will boost higher in its clocks and have a bit more overclocking headroom. You can go 106% beyond, well, 6% extra on top of the 90 watts. So you have some overclocking headroom in there, and that's why it's a more expensive card at $170 instead of the base price of $150 for some of the cheaper models. We'll have a separate teardown video for this one because this is a new cooler design for EVGA and it allows them to get the cost down at lower, which is worth looking at in depth, so make sure you check back for that. This model also includes a metal backplate, which is one of the main marketing features because at this price point, that's rare. The card runs 896 CUDA cores or 7 SMs at 128 CUDA cores per SM, which leaves us wondering when the 1650 Ti will release as this is not the fully populated die. EVGA's boost clock on the card is 1860 MHz with memory at 8 gigabits per second and we can do some overclocking to get things better than that. Let's get into benchmarking. We'll have 1080p and 1440p tests primarily with overclocking, power, thermals, and frame time charts thrown in, and we managed to get all of this done in just the last couple of hours. So uh, there are still, of course, things you could do beyond the tests we've done. So if you really wanted to buy this card and use it at higher resolutions in some games that are lighter weight, you could drop the graphic settings a bit, but we left with our standard benchmarking settings for now because it'll allow us to compare it versus all the other cards and remain timely. So let's let's just get right into it. F1 2018 and the Ego engine are first. At 1080p, the GTX 1650 XE Ultra runs at 61 FPS average with room to improve if settings were reduced toward high or medium. The RX 570, for a competitive reference, runs at 66 FPS average. This is a lead of about 9% and will be a theme through most of this review with one outlier. The GTX 1060 6GB holds a strong lead over both, running at 75 FPS average, demonstrating that the 1650 isn't the successor to the 1060, but rather the 1660 non-TI was. An overclock gets us to 66 FPS average for the 1650 XE Ultra, which ties the RX 570 stock card. Not a great place to be, 
especially considering you can still overclock the 570 and also it's cheaper. At 1440p, the 1650 runs at 46 FPS average with ultra high settings, which really isn't all that bad when considering where we came from a few years ago. A settings reduction would even allow an average of 60 FPS, if so desired. Unfortunately for the 1650, the RX 570 still performs better here. Not just an average frame rate, but also measurably and perceptibly in frame time performance. This is something we've demonstrated relating to F1 2018 in the past as well, and so isn't really a new revelation. Overclocking pushes to 50 FPS average, but that's still just not enough. We need more than that. Apex Legends is up next. This is a modern DirectX 11 game that we set to all high settings. Then we use a highly controlled multiplayer test course. We test away from other players, but within the actual game, our previous content discovered that this was highly representative of real gameplay in multiplayer and is the most accurate way we found to benchmark. At 1080p and with all high settings, the 1650 XE Ultra places at 64 FPS average with lows reasonably well timed at 49 and 41 FPS, 1% and 0.1% lows. The RX 570 isn't as advantaged here as it will be in Sniper in the next test, as the workload has moved to DirectX 11 and drops asynchronous command support versus what Sniper will allow. The 570's 70 FPS average allows it a lead of 9% over the stock 1650 XE Ultra. Overclocking the 1650 got it close to the stock RX 570, but the card still fell short with a 69 FPS average or an improvement of about 7% over baseline. The GTX 1066GB card hasn't been retested since our initial round with Apex Legends, but was at 72 FPS average at the time of last test. It may be a few percentage points faster now, but not much. The results overall haven't really changed much for the other retested cards. Moving on to frame times, again, being mindful that lower is better, but more consistent is better than lower, we see that the Gigabyte RX 574GB card managed performance in a range of roughly 11 milliseconds to 25 milliseconds, with the average falling closer to 15 to 16 milliseconds. Although the data is more spurious than we see in some other games, there still aren't any extreme swings in frame-to-frame -frame interval. This is important and shows that the card is performing smoothly overall. The 1650, as we plot it, performs, well, about where you would expect it, given the average FPS chart, seen as average FPS is just derived from frame times anyway. No major spurious swings from the mean, so that's good. It's just that the 570 still manages to be highly competitive in this test to the point where it's, well, it's cheaper and often better in frame rate. So that's really all you need to know. We'll plot the 1050 Ti just to get it on the chart, although it'd need serious settings reductions to really play fluidly in this game. 1050 Ti doesn't have extreme excursions from the mean either, but it certainly is slower on average. Sniper Elite 4 is next. This game uses the Asura engine and is one of the best built DirectX 12 titles out. We use DX12, asynchronous compute, high settings, and test primarily at 1080p for this class of video card. That said, we also have some 4K tests strictly for synthetic comparison to a wider range of products. For now, let's start with the more realistic 1080p setting. At 1080p, the GTX 1650 XC Ultra runs Sniper Elite at 71 FPS average, with lows at 61 FPS and 53 FPS 0.1%. This particular game is compute intensive, and so AMD's RX 570 leverages architectural advantages to lead the 1650 by about 36%, the 97 FPS average. The GTX 1066 GB Gaming X leads at both the RX 570 and the GTX 1650, although the latter is led more significantly with its 104 FPS average. Overclocking the 1650 to about 2085 MHz gets it to 77 FPS average, an improvement over baseline of 8%. Improvement in the 1650 over the 1050 Ti is meaningful, posting 24% uplift, but it doesn't compete well with the RX 570 in this title. Actually, it's the worst in this title. This title is sort of an outlier, and that's something you need to keep in mind going forward. Here's a frame time plot for Sniper Elite 4. Remember that frame times are the base metric for frame rate and are important as they don't average out potential issues that average FPS and even 1% lows can obscure. The RX 574 gigabyte card runs exceptionally well here with an average frame time of about 10 milliseconds frame to frame. This line is nearly perfectly flat, which is what we want to see. The flatter the line, the less the variance. For reference, 16.667 milliseconds is 60 FPS. We have observed that excursions beyond 8 to 12 milliseconds frame to frame will cause users to notice stutter. As for the new 1650, the line is relatively smooth. It's just slower than the RX 570. Finally, the GTX 1050 Ti 4GB card on this line ends up at about 15 to 22 milliseconds on average, with more spurious frame time consistency along its plot. It's not bad, but this card is clearly not particularly high-end. 4K is obviously not a real-world scenario for these cards, 
but we're going to briefly look at 4K sniper charts for a synthetic comparison and seeing the card hierarchy. The RX 570 again leads, this time by 41% over the 1650 XE Ultra. Again, a bit of an outlier. Overclocking the XE Ultra marginally helps, but not enough to change the stack. The 1650 and 570 are both still led by the GTX 1066GB. Far Cry 5 at 1080p has the GTX 1650 XE Ultra at 56 FPS average, which is again behind the RX 570 62 FPS average. The 570 maintains a steady lead of 10.5% while managing to be cheaper. The GTX 1060, for what it's worth, still leads, but we're only pointing it out because some of the rumors had suggested that the 1650 might surpass the 1060, which was clearly wrong and not something that we ever suspected to be true, hence not reporting it originally. Overclocking puts the 1650 to 61 FPS average, an improvement of about 8%. 1440p doesn't play much into this story. The RX 570 again leads the 1650 at 1440p. Neither card is particularly meant to play this game at 1440p, so we'll move on quickly to the next chart. GTA 5 has typically posted much better performance on Nvidia than AMD when compared relatively to other games, and that remains true here. At 1080p, the GTX 1650 XE Ultra ties the RX 570 for the first time all review. The two results are roughly within margin of error of one another for averages, although we'd like to see better lows than the 1650 posted. The GTX 1060 still leads both handily with an 83 FPS average. It's not even close to what some of the rumors projected, with a 1066GB still holding a lead of 31% over the 1650. Overclocking allows an important improvement to 68 FPS average, which is enough to tie the stock 780 Ti reference model, although obviously overclocked 780 Ti's hold a significant lead here, as seen on this chart. The 570, for what it's worth, could also be overclocked here, but we're arguing over single-digit movements at this point, and the two cards are effectively the same in average FPS for GTA 5. At 1440p, the GTX 1650 XE Ultra continues its tie with the RX 570 with an overclock stretching up towards 46 FPS average, nearing the RX 580 Gaming X stock. That's not bad, but GTA 5 has been the only instance of this thus far, and overclocked 570 would encroach similarly on the 580, as we demonstrated years ago with the RX 400 and 500 launches. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is last, and is another modern DirectX 12 title. For this one, the GTX 1650 XE Ultra operates an average of about 50 FPS, predictably allowing it to lead the 960 and 1050 Ti, but also allowing the RX 570 lead of about 9.3%. Please note, again, that dropped settings further would obviously allow relative playability in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, although overclocking helps a little bit. The 50 FPS average is fine for comparative purposes with our higher settings, but if you wanted to play the game with a higher FPS, it could be done dropping to about medium. Overclocking pushed us to 52 FPS average. Instability in the OC dropped our low-end performance for frame time consistency, unfortunately. This could be improved with more time spent on overclocking. For example, if Nvidia released the drivers, to press ahead of launch. That's not gonna stop us from a launch day review though. At 1440p, the 1650's 33 FPS average doesn't inspire much confidence with these settings. The game would need a serious settings reduction to bring this closer to fluidity. Strictly for comparative purposes though, we learn that the RX 570 holds a lead once again, this time at 38 FPS average for about a 15% lead. This table shows our overclock stepping, providing a look at the very quick process we followed to get our overclock. We were able to sort of hold 2100 MHz, but it wasn't stable in all games tested, and so we had to pull back to 2085 MHz for the final average frequency. Peaks depend on thermals, as always, and this is illustrated immediately in the top three rows of our table. We changed nothing between those three rows, the first three, and just let temperature slowly rise on its own, eventually dropping us from 1980 MHz to 1935 MHz, once nearing 60 degrees Celsius. This demonstrates how Boost works. After this, we started actually overclocking the card, settling for just a 160 MHz offset and 400 MHz offset for the memory. We sort of had 175 stable for core, but 0.1% lows were dropping way too hard, and so we reverted to 160 for the core offset. The last chart is power consumption, where we have total system power consumption measured at the wall and logged. So this is total system power consumption. It's not just for the card, but the system's heavily controlled, and so we can compare them by the deltas. The SC Ultra system, let's get, get that right there, SC Ultra, is drawing around 200 to 220 watts peak for the full system, whereas the RX 570 system is drawing uh, over 300 watts, like 290 to a little over 300 watts. So clearly the 570 is drawing more power, and that's where you start to balance out against some of that performance we saw earlier. So then, the RX 570. Uh, we made fun of AMD a little bit 
for Radeon 7 finally matching 1080 Ti performance after a couple of years. That was, it, it just, it was really not the biggest accomplishment. It was a good thing, for sure, and we were happy to see it. But it's not a huge accomplishment to match your competitors' previous generation or previous, previous generation product a few years later. That's what this is doing. The RX 570, the tables have now turned, the RX 570 is an RX 470, which is like maybe three years old now or something like that from the AMD Macau event. Uh, so getting pretty old and it's beating this and it's $130 on average, maybe 140, something like that. Worst, absolute worst case is they're like 150 bucks for a, a pretty good one. But there are five seventies out there, which are four seventies for in the 130 to 140 range. And they'll beat this which is a good card. Like EVGA did a really good job at building this video card. It's unfortunate that EVGA ends up with the GPU they did because they don't make that part. But you know, the cooler's really pretty reasonable at the price. It's a 90 watt power uh, target baseline instead of 75, and it's got a six pin connector on it. So you're losing part of the benefit of the 1650 in favor of more performance. And even with that boosted performance, the 570 is still winning out, and we used a pretty cheap 570 with four gigabytes of memory. So, I, the 570 is the easier choice here, because uh, worst case scenario for the 570, it's about tied in GTA 5. Now, this card's reasonable to overclock, but even that isn't really getting it past stock 570 performance, and then of course you could overclock the 570 as well. So the 570 is cheaper. It is typically seven to maybe 10%, 10.5% better on average with one outlier in Sniper Elite 4. And uh, worst case is it's tied, it, but it's cheaper. And this is something that came out a few years ago, like the original one, 470. So uh, really not impressive, the 1650. And that makes it impossible to recommend. So we just, it's not like it's a terrible ripoff or anything, and those have certainly existed in the past. It's just that it's not competitive, and that's what matters in a competitive market. So uh, we would typically push toward a 570 at this price point. $130 is actually a really good deal. We were looking at them the other day and remarked internally about how, wow, that's actually a really good deal on a card that used to be about $200 at launch and was supposed to be 180 or so. The primary or only upside of the 1650 is the lack of requirement for a PCIe connector and the really low power consumption at 75 watts. So you could put it in a system with no available PCIe connectors, or maybe you just need a video out, but still some reasonable potential to process something on the GPU, maybe like a home server. There's value there. The 570 will require a PCIe connector. It will typically draw more power. So if those things bother you, then this really isn't bad. You'd have to buy one a different model, but it's not bad. It's just that that's a, that's a pretty limited scenario where you find usefulness. It's not, a, it's not a massive enough difference where if you can deal with a power connector, you shouldn't go with the 570. You should you just buy the 570 instead. So that's it for this one. Thank you for watching. We did our best to get it out quickly despite NVIDIA's best efforts. So hopefully NVIDIA will push drivers to press and advance in the, in the future. They typically do it. This one was just weird. So we'll leave it there. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to support us directly. And go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus to get access to our behind the scenes videos. Thank you for watching. I will see you all next time.